This is Crash Course U.S. History, and today we're going to talk about one of the worst relationships in American history. No, Chad, oh, how's well, the not volume? my college girlfriend and me. Mr. Green, Mr. Green, your relationship with your high school girlfriend? Oh, me from the past. You and I both know that I didn't have a high school girlfriend. No, I'm talking about the relationship between Native Americans and English settlers. Ah, oh, it's so loud. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm talking about the, um... Their, so as like, you'll know intro that thing. last week, the first English oh, settlers yeah, came I... to the Chesapeake area, now Virginia, in 1607. The land the English found was, of course, already inhabited by Indian tribes unified under the leadership of Chief Wahoon Sonica, and I will remind you that mispronouncing things is my thing! The English called this Chief Powhatan, because, of course, mispronouncing things was also their thing. Powhatan was actually his title and the name of his tribe, but to say that the English lacked cultural sensitivity would be an understatement. So Powhatan didn't get... English okay. bad. Yeah, English bad because they can't English pronounce bad. names. Yeah, you know, Lacked cultural sensitivity. As uh, if the Amerindians yeah. pronounced the English names perfectly on the first time. Like, are we yeah. supposed to assume that? If his if his I mean, insult or barb has any meaning, that's what we're supposed to assume. And it's not like Google yeah. Translate or even a standard. <laughs> yeah, it didn't exist. Like they they had to. I, I can't even imagine the difficulty involved in two people, you know, two people's meeting for the first time and trying to learn how to communicate with no yes. understanding with, of without the other's things language like the telephone or, or computers. You what? Know, without things like the, without things like the telephone to, to communicate the data. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, no technology. Yeah, no technology. And and I bet these fuckers didn't even have a written language most of the time too. Which no, they did. Really helps they did. communication. They had their, well, they yeah, had their minds know. blown by you know what they called talking papers or the notion that like the Englishmen could send letters to one another and have meaning conveyed through paper. Yeah, there's also the claim that that like. Uh, the English being insensitive would be an understatement. It's just like ridiculous because, for practical sake, the English and other Northwestern Europeans were the most culturally sensitive peoples on the planet because not only did they not actively try and wipe out the people they conquered, but they actually tried to preserve the artifacts of the people and learn about them. Well, Whereas I mean, everywhere else in history, everywhere else in history, any people that was conquered by another people would have its artifacts destroyed and its culture erased obviously you know, I'm in, sure that'd in be... china um okay. it's, it's like a really big deal whenever they find like a dug up pit of a bunch of artifacts um because those artifacts had been you know uh attempted to be destroyed by what, whichever dynasty had uh conquered that area and uh you know so much information on the peoples around so... the uh different Chinese dynasties as you're saying know, as you're saying you say that the English aren't like the Isis or Al Qaeda where they just destroy or sell artifacts out of way they're, they're not like normal they're not like well, well the problem is though like they're not like just any other kind of race of people because the problem the thing is we see this kind of cultural destruction not just among us kind of but every other uh you know people as well where the typical way things go is that uh, in all parts of the world, except for Northwestern Europe. Yeah, I mean, uh, look what the Ottomans did. It, they, they did their killing and enslaving. They made sure to cut the junk off the slaves so they couldn't reproduce. And what do you know? Turkey doesn't have any black slave descendants kvetching about reparations these days. Well, that's an interesting so. topic in and of itself, too, because like the process by which they castrated their slaves, their largely white slaves taken from the Barbary right. slave trade, was... Mm -hmm well, white and black, was so brutal that a significant portion of them died. But it's also important, too, to note that the Indians weren't a monolith. It's not as though the Indian nation was one people. When, <clears throat> when the English got to what we would now know as the United States, there were so many different warring tribes <clears throat> that even... You know, clans within the same tribe would have would have been um, opposed at different points in time. So, and they certainly warred with one another. And you can, you can take a look at this map that I have pulled up, and you can say that, oh well, look at I mean, all this land was occupied. No, this is just a sort of general range of these tribes because, by and large, these tribes were mostly nomadic. There were some that did have. Um, you know, more static villages, but that was the exception rather than the rule. Well, yeah, I think the leader, uh, the leader of over 
what what counts for the overcount of the Native American population is that they would look at these supposed sites where the Native Americans were or the Amerindians were. But they realized that since they tended to migrate from camp to camp on like a rotating basis chronologically, that would lead to you thinking that there are more Amerindians there than there actually are because they would just live in one of several different spots throughout the year. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe uh, an analysis by owner and chaplain um, actually tried to look at and uh, uh, like estimate the actual number by not like just counting every single site as a different tribe and came to far lower population estimates. Um, right. Like their their population estimate, I believe, was about like uh, of Native Americans in North America was like one point five nine five million. Yeah, which is the low. Yeah, the low millions, low single very digit low. millions. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. We got a lot of video to go. Get to be the leader of over Let's thirty go. tribes by being a dummy, and he quickly realized that one, the English were pretty clueless when it came to not dying of starvation, and two, that is so rich. Because they had the notion gone. that the so English were clueless as to help them and. How to not starve to death? I mean, which one of these two civilizations actually had civilization? Which one of these had, um, you know, job specialization and uh, the concept of metallurgy and other other technology? Like the Europeans were so yeah. far beyond where the Indians were. The notion that they they didn't know how to not starve to death is is just retarded. I mean, maybe like. The possible explanation for that is they were city folk, you know, kind of urbanite yuppies or whatever that came to the frontier and are figuring out how to grow things themselves. That that could be a possible angle of explanation. But I mean, the, the way he insinuates it, obviously, it means is that you got these dumb, helpless white people, and then you got the non-whites who know what they're doing. Kind of. Uh, well, phenomenon. I think it also had to do with the time of year that they ended up arriving. Um, in what would be now known as the United States. Like, if you're arriving just a couple of months before winter, you really don't have a whole lot of time to set up shop um, sure. and try and cultivate crops so you don't starve to death. And you certainly don't have any knowledge of, you know, the local, you know, climate zones and what crops will gr grow well in there. Um, it's pretty well established fact that at least the first couple of uh, waves of immig white immigration to what would now be known as the United States, they actually intended on landing far further south. So now they're in a much colder climate than they had anticipated. So, mm -hmm. like, there's a reason one of these groups had, you know, flintlock firearms and the other didn't, and the other was still hunter gatherers. Oh, yeah, because uh, the, back home they had. A very advanced agriculture and and civilization. It was just a. Uh, it was just the fact <laughs> that they were in a completely new environment. Um, yeah. At, at, with with certain bad circumstances, such as landing, just a few months before winter, far more north than they had anticipated. Um, yeah, I think was, John Green uh, at least implicitly is forgetting to understand labor specialization. Context of their situation. Like the idea of not everyone has to be a freaking farmer for your civilization to survive. Well, it so seems like obviously... we... yeah. well and it seems, it seems to me he's, too he's just that... forgetting the context. Well, it seems to me too that these Indians should have done more to help these Europeans from starving to death. I mean, these are people fleeing persecution. Oh, that's all right. They're asylum seekers. They're refugees washing up at your show. Indian Squanto. These are the poor, tired, huddled <laughs> masses. You need to take ah. care of them. Ah, ah, this is your responsibility. Obligation. Yes. That's uh, true. Use your privilege. Use your privilege to help those who are not as fortunate. And you know, the fact that any of these uh, asylum seekers died, you know, just reflects how disgusting your society is. You should have done more. You could have done more. I mean, look what sort of plenty you had that you could have shared. You could have redistributed your own wealth. Yeah, all the pilgrims that died during winter and the concentration camps you had at the border. Oy vey. <laughs> all right, we got, we got to keep going. We got a lot Let's of go. video left. The English were in deal. In fact, colony leader John Smith went so far as to order the colonists to stop stealing food from the Indians. Oh, in the book business, this is known as foreshadowing. So as... Real quick, there is zero yeah, citation the for that. Was, yeah. There's zero yeah. citation for that. No I citations. can't find anything. 
Um, I don't know where he's pulling that from, that they ordered them not call, to steal. That's what we call a blood libel. But even then, even if he is alluding supposedly to some actual quote that technically happened, there is just no way that he is quoting it charitably. Mm-hmm. Or that it he, he's been quoting short, it correctly. But, yeah. No, for it certain. Could have been that they, um, and that they were just over hunting certain areas. He would be like the that. first one. Of, yeah. He would be the first one to apologize for looters and rioters and thieves in the modern day saying, well, their material needs weren't met. Yes. So that's why yeah. they had to steal. I mean, you know, if the Europeans, these religious Puritans who really believed that thou shall not steal was a command from God, if they're being driven to steal, my guess would be that their material needs were not met and they were on the verge of starving to death. Oh, oh, so you're saying that they didn't just steal because they were dumb, evil white crackers, right? They weren't just white devils kind of marching around and just taking what they wanted? As hard as that uh, is to believe, yes. Oh, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. No, they're not. Oh, <laughs> yeah, the Aladdin, oh, what is it? Like the Aladdin attribution to thieves just completely stops when we're talking about white people. Like and- that, that phenomenon apparently doesn't apply. And before we move on to, I just want to point out his This Machine Kills Fascist stickers. Like, this guy is just so freaking insufferable. And, and the thing is, the thing is, this machine makes fascists. <laughs> oh, I think I see what you were trying to say with me. Continuing yeah. <laughs> on. Just come on. Previously noted, relationships, whether between individuals or collectives, tend to go well when they are mutually beneficial. And for a while, both the English and the Indians were better off for these interactions. I mean, you know, post smallpox. The Virginia Company existed to make money, and since the Chesapeake lacked gold or silver, making money required trade. Okay, let's go to the thought bubble. We tend to think of trade between Europeans and natives as being a one-way exchange, like savvy, exploitative Europeans tricking primitive, pure indigenous people into unfair deals, but that isn't quite accurate. Both sides traded goods that they had in surplus for those they did not. The English were happy to give up iron utensils, tools, guns, woven cloth, in exchange at least for furs and speaking a little truth here. Days, food, which the Indians could easily part with because they had plenty. Soon, though, there were problems. In order to keep up trade relations, Indian men devoted more time to hunting and less to agriculture, which upset traditional gender balance in their society, and European ideas so again Upset there's no gender balance in their society I know, we, we had such a tough time figuring out what he meant by this last night well i mean here's I mean, the thing there's zero citation for this i mean it stands to reason that this could plausibly be true but nothing nothing is cited there's no and again these tribes weren't a monolith maybe it might have happened in one tribe but to say that this in that interaction with the Europeans every single time resulted in a the upsetting of the gender balance is, is laughable. And what, are we saying that upsetting traditional gender norms, John Green, is a bad thing for society? Why would that Maybe. be? Well, well, only we if... In chat. Oh, nice. Mod, okay. mod me. Uh, mod me, I'll, I'll, I'll ban it. Wait, what happened? Oh, We, have, we have a sex bot in chat. <laughs> Ah. No, no, it could, it could just be a user whose name happens to be sex69.fun. It could just be a person. <laughs> it could just be trolling us. <laughs> open your mind. Yeah, open your mind. <laughs> I, don't I was about to say, a, I don't even as a, as a, pulled up. As a possible explanation, I think, for why he would kvetch at this upsetting of traditional gender rules is if these traditional gender rules were supposedly more egalitarian. Because I think he said more men started hunting. So I guess that means not as many men hunted and maybe they did more gathering with the women or they did more agricultural stuff with the women. So things were all peaceful and equal. And then the men started going out hunting more and that was a big problem. I, I think that's what he's getting at. He is about- but like, you know, he obviously he supports all sorts of egalitarianism, quote unquote. That's um, true. Yeah. Among lots Explain. of people. Explains why he would take issue with it, I suppose. But and maybe I don't they have, need to change the well, I, I think I think it's just I think it's just I think it's just that whatever I don't have a direct citation. Whatever, whatever helps him is bad to him. 
I don't have a direct citation. Yeah. Like I can't link a video to this, but I'm certain at some point in time he talks about you know how gender norms bad in in European society and American society oh. as we move on into like the industrial Absolutely. age. Oh, you can be certain of that. Yes. But anyhow, let's get going. Ideas about land use started to overcome traditional Indian ways of life, and that led to conflict. The English liked to fence in some of their land, which kept the Indians off it, and also the English let their pigs and cattle roam freely, and the animals would eat natives' crops. And so, which is it, John? Here, didn't we? Which is it, John? Is putting up fences bad, or are the Europeans bad for not putting up fences? Like, you can't criticize them in the same sentence for putting up fences and then criticize them for not putting up fences for their animals. Yeah, it's... And again, to what also, degree like, did this occur? Because maybe you can find one isolated instance of this occurring, maybe maybe one settlement, but to say that this happened all up and down the coast is I, I'm dubious. I'm dubious and I you're not providing could, any citations. So. I mean, I think we could literally call this it hasn't been coined a term yet, but I'm going to try to do it now. The smallpox blanket fallacy, where apparently if one isolated incident of it suddenly becomes a supposedly rampant phenomenon. Because again, it was like 1763 it was the one time there was a smallpox blanket attempted to be used to get the Indians sick. And then it's like all we fucking hear about when it comes to how evil the white man was to the Amerindians. It's like this happened once and then Ward Churchill lied about a couple other times. But why is it such a meme? And so then it, it may be the same things happening here where there are a couple people putting up some fences or whatever. And then that uh, was uh, was really bad for Indian agriculture, Amerindian agriculture. But it's like, well, uh, imagine, again, I don't trust them. Imagine having your society be so technologically backwards that the sophisticated <laughs> technology of a fence is just what does you in. That does oh, it. Oh, like, I know. You guys are both well, mods then, now, by the way, too, so you can ban people in chat. All right, cool. Well, I didn't like it's gonna die. <laughs> it's like the dude that's trying to um, carry a pair of skis, but they're like holding it horizontally, and they can't get through the doorway. <laughs> like, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, or like it's the like, dog that, that, with a stick in his mouth can't get through the doorway. Yeah, exactly. It's like apparently, if this is what fucks you up, then you deserve to get fucked up. Exactly. Exactly. That's Darwinism at work. Well, Which I'm also, sure he's a huge reason, believer like, in. Yeah. Well, it also, the, th the thing is, though, when it comes to the Native Americans using, like, not being able to use English land, the thing is, the English, when they arrived, did not become nomadic like the Native Americans. And there's only so much you can use a land. Oh, I mean, and so, and so they, the English had permanent settlements, and they were always having to use the land around them. Um, whereas the Native Americans were nomadic, and could use and so like native american tribes would i'm assuming have an easier time using each other's land because they weren't all using it at the same time um so the idea that like white people uh putting up fences around their land is is like bad for i mean you know it's just it's like a, such a bad thing because they're not letting the native americans use it well the white people aren't nomadic they're they're permanent settlers and they need that land um, where, whereas, you know, like there's no ability to share that land. And if the white people don't share, I mean, like don't keep that land to themselves, the Na Native Americans are going to use it and then the white people are going to starve even more. All right, continuing on. Sense? As Europeans' appetite for furs grew, Indian tribes began to fight with each other over access to the best hunting grounds, leading to intertribal warfare. What? Indians going. didn't just fight white man, they fought each other? They only oh, fought so because the white people made things all weird, though. <laughs> it's all the white man's fault, though. <laughs> it's the same kind of oppression narrative shit, where even yeah, if... Like they always say, just about, you know, yeah, just like interracial crime, like black-on-black -black violence, is somehow still our fault as well. It's the same thing. Well, and they act uh, as yeah, though there was no was war going on prior to you know european <laughs> yeah. involvement on the continent but and, yes the the mass grave at crow creek would like to have a word with you <laughs> well it well, doesn't yeah, help like, that the indians didn't have a written language so they can't that. record anything oh that would have helped too we got shit that's always trying to say is that um minorities fighting is the fault of whites because of divide and conquer 
You know, and that's clearly just not the case. Uh, it, you know, it, it, it's it's something people do. It's like minorities and whites will always fight. It's just it's just being human. You know, and trying to pin it all on whites is, is just is a blood libel. You know, calm time relatively calm time. Yes, at one point Smith was captured by the Indians and had to be saved by Powhatan's daughter Pocahontas, but this was probably all a ritual planned by Powhatan to demonstrate his dominance over the English. Po they were just pretending to be savages. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were just pretending to kill them. We were, we were just, no, no, see, those really were showers. Those were not chambers. Those were just for show. That's a that's like a serious form of psychological torture, though. Like, people do that into the modern day. Oh, mock yeah, executions? Called, yes, exactly. Mock executions are a way to mess with people. Like, very malignantly. Finright says, no, I heard, um, I heard yeah. a claim that some people in Turkey look white now is because of the enslavement of Eastern Europeans and sex slavery among the Ottomans was very common. I thought it was the and other way America. around. I thought it was the other way around, where it was predominantly, you know, in ancient times, back when Turkey was Asia Minor, you know, it was populated largely by, you know, whiter-looking Greeks and Romans than the modern Greek and Romans, and through time, Arab admixture got into the area. But I, I may well, just be uh, no, talking out of my ass on that one. Uh, I, was, I was listening to something that said that the Ottoman Empire, in order to build up their harems, were were very, very interested in accumulating white women to put in the harems, and then the sultan would knock them all up, and then eventually there would be an heir to the sultan through uh, a son. So I think that's where all the admixture came from, is that the people leading these empires were very, very thoroughly admixed with Europeans in this generally Turkic Ottoman Empire. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Um... But going back to uh, what you're saying about Powhatan uh, and the su supposed fake execution attempt of John Smith, um, I can tell you of a real execution uh, that the Native Americans perpetrated against another colon colony leader. I think it was um, Ratcliffe, you know, in the uh, in the Disney Pocahontas movie, I believe. Um, and uh, the real fate of Ratcliffe which is completely different from the movie, was that he went, he and some other uh, English colon, uh, settlers went to go trade um, some stuff for food with one of the uh, Native American tribes. And uh, what happened was he and his men were each led into separate uh, building, or well, separate like teepees, under the assumption that they were going to trade. They were then... Um, uh, they were then restrained, oh. and all of them had their skin cut off while still alive, thrown into the fire in front of them, and then they were killed. Whoa. Yeah, obviously you know, the natives were... Which is a brutal execution. Times. Yeah, a brutal execution of people just trying to peacefully trade. Well, it's got to be the, you know, the white man's fault somehow. Surely they must have done something to deserve it, of course. It can't be that these noble savages were in the wrong. Like, I just don't accept that. Yeah, I mean, after watching Dances with Wolves, I have a hard time believing that. <laughs> I mean, did you see how Kevin Costner was treated by the Indians? He was treated pretty good. Yeah, or uh, in the knockoff movie of Avatar back in 2009. Honest never married John. Yeah, yeah. Um... Pocahontas never married John Smith, by the way, but she was kidnapped by the English and held for ransom in 1613, and she did eventually marry another Englishman, John Rolfe. She converted to Christianity and went to England, where she became a sensation and died of disease. Stupid disease, always deciding the course of human history. Anyway, despite not marrying Pocahontas, John Smith is still important to this story because when he left Virginia for England after being injured in a gunpowder explosion, Things between the Native Americans and the English immediately began to deteriorate. How? Well, the English went back to stealing Indians' crops and also began stealing their lives via massacres. There's no citation for this provided. There's no, yep. like, no citation. I'm trying to Just figure out. English. It seems like a complete non sequitur. Like, he, he seems to. He heavily intimates that the causal factor in the change in Indian European relations is the destruction of their gunpowder stores. 
But I'm, I'm trying to figure out how that factors in unless the Indians at that point realize that, hey, no more guns, they're a whole lot less or a whole lot more vulnerable. Yep. Thanks, Thought Bubble. And also he's just blaming the English entirely for that. Uh, yeah, apparently, for, apparently, yeah, the, the Amerindians never do anything wrong. It's always the English starting do everything. Nothing. How does that even happen, too? Like, I'm trying to envision a scenario in which Europeans can sneak into, like, an Indian camp and abscond with, you know, a, a large quantity of resources. Well, they could they could have just been implying they were, they were stealing stuff at gunpoint. Though, like, at that point, uh, tensions would be pretty, uh, like, much more intense... And I feel like you would have leaders negotiating to deal point. with that. I feel like that's not just theft at that point. That has now escalated to something else, like a raid. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I feel, it's, again, just, just knowing reason. what a shithead John Green is, if that were the case, <laughs> you would certainly bring that up. Thanks, oh, absolutely. That, that's true. If there are more bad details to say, he would say them. He, he brought up supposed massacres, so, you know. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Man, you guys sure know how to end on a downer, although to be fair, there are not a lot of uppers in this story. So after a period of peace following Pocahontas' marriage to John Rolfe in 1614, dramatized here, things finally came to a head in 1622 when Chief Opechancanough kind of led a rebellion against the English. It had become abundantly clear that more and more English were going to show up, and they weren't just there to trade, they wanted to take Indian land. But the How can you rebel against a foreign power? Yeah, I mean, that's just called, called war. Well, that's interesting. A rebellion means that they're in some kind of subordinate role like they're being governed under i think right? he, there's someone's governing over him, them he painted himself into a corner where he had to talk about a war waged between indians and uh europeans that was mm -hmm. started by indians and he had to couch it in some sort of um linguistic mm -hmm. sophistry to make well them i'm waiting to see so noble I'm waiting to see what words he uses for the 1622 Jamestown massacre. Because again, hundreds of people, men, women, and children, were killed in the most rank and awful war crimes violating fashion possible. And I'm wondering what kind of chicken shit language he's going to use. Or did he already, and, uh, did he already uh, gloss over it? Uh, I, I, I don't think don't he did yet, did he? I think so. Okay, not yet. Okay, so. He's getting there. And, and um, what's more is the... Uh... What was I going to say? What's he was the also saying that the English were going to take we're going to take Native American land, but also you know there's a claim that Native Americans didn't have a concept of land ownership. So, oh, that's also important. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> What's the over under you think on him, like just mentioning uh, the massacre in passing, like in one sentence? Oh, it's as he... <laughs> one sentence. Pretty sure it's one sentence. Yeah, I think that doesn't need oh, to be an sentence. over or an under, or maybe an under if he says it zero times. But there's no over. And after another failed uprising in 1644, the 2,000 remaining Native what? Americans were forced to sign a... But, what, you just skipped to it. What, what a fag fuck. What the hell? Did he he just, just called it a rebellion. Yeah, well, he I think it, he, yeah, he called it I think he, failed uprising. But 1644, yeah, that's past 1622, the Jamestown Massacre, though. I cannot like, well, believe okay. he completely omitted it. So then, like, okay, I, next shit. time I meet John Green, I'm going to say, hey, you know about that My Lay uprising in March 1968? You know all about that, huh? Do, do, do you know all about the uh, Katyn uprising in Poland that the Soviets perpetrated? Like, what kind of <laughs> bullshit logic is that? Or did the Tulsa Race Rebellion in June 1921? The, the uh, the rebellion of Vienna in there. Were it not for the laws of this server, I would play a game of Minecraft with him. <laughs> uh, careful there. Careful there. Moving okay. on. Consign them to reservations. That's in the obviously West. a well, joke. Virginia, at least. But the 1622 uprising. Oh, wait, okay, I think oh, I got yeah, to get to it. Oh, get to it, okay. okay. It was the final nail in the coffin of the Virginia Company, which was a failure in every way. It never turned a profit, and despite sponsoring 6,000 I love how he calls it an uprising. When Virginia became a royal colony, Not a massacre, an uprising. People were still alive, proving once again that governments are better at governing than corporations. Up in New England, you'll recall that... 
I mean, yeah, I can I can believe that. Governments are better at governing than corporations. <laughs> Uh, but not, well, not what like, was the not functional like really difference deal. at this juncture? Yeah, uh, th- yeah, that's that's one of the things. Is like, um, well, governments actually, uh, I guess, have the ability to tax people, and the Virginia Company did not have the ability to tax the colonists. Uh, so it probably would have been more money. To, uh, yeah, yeah. Virginia, com- well, having more money and a more reliable source of income, uh, the Virginia mm. Company probably would have been more profitable if it had been able to tax the colonists. Right. Okay, but the I'm wondering. We would, yeah. No, I did keep going. And have survived their first winter without help from the Native Americans, which of course led to the first Thanksgiving and then centuries of mutually beneficial trade and generosity. Just kidding. While some of the Puritans who settled in New England, notably Roger Williams, tried to treat the Indians fair. I mean, is he claiming general, that the natives were not uplifted we as a result of interaction with Europeans? Because that's precisely well, he's, what happened. He's claiming that. That the, that the Native Americans didn't True, do there was a lot of back and forth. Fall. There were wars waged. Um, you know, there were atrocities perpetrated on both sides, largely by the, the Amerindians, but on, on both sides, yes. Um, but certainly, I don't, I don't know how you can claim, like, go to an Indian reservation or go to a casino and tell me that they weren't uplifted from the well, I mean, gathering. I suppose, but then they might say, well, there's all this alcoholism, and there's all this crime, and there's the disappearing Amerindian woman phenomenon, and oh, that's we'll really set that them later. back. We'll get to that later. <laughs> okay, all right, let's go. <laughs> Settlers thought Native Americans could be replaced because they weren't properly using the land. Now, John Winthrop, who you'll remember from last week, at least realized that it was better to buy land from Indians than just take it. But Puritan land purchases usually came with strings attached, the main string being that the Native Americans had to submit to English authority. Now, the Puritans had a rather conflicted view of the Indians. On the one hand, they saw natives as heathen. If they didn't want to submit to English authority, it would seem to me that they could probably just, you know, not tread on English land. Yeah, like, if you don't want to be around the English, then don't be around the English. Now, Jim, um... I'm going to be a dick here. I know this is your strain, but can you pause next time before you start talking? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah. Indians saying, come over and help us. On the other hand, they recognized that the Native American way of life with its relative abundance and equality, especially when it came to women, might be tempting to some people who might want to go native. This was such a... Oh, they're so good. Oh, they're just so <laughs> wonderful. Equality for women... Equality for women. Oh. In so far as they were so all tempting. living in squalor. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, uh, the, uh, but didn't you hear him say abundance? Didn't you hear him say abundance? Oh, I guess we'll take his word for it. But. In 1642, the Massachusetts General Court prescribed a sentence of three years hard labor for anyone who left the colony and went to live with the indigenous people. There was even anti-India propaganda. Okay. I mean, okay. But like... Really, like, what are the numbers here? How many, like, English people wanted to go native? And again, I get the sense... This I doubt not, it was serious. I get the sense that this was not a charitable interpretation of what was going on there. It would seem to me that this um, is sort of, not reminiscent, but this, this foreshadows a lot of the legislation passed by the English crown later on, just, just preceding the American Revolution, where they're prohibiting... Um, white settlers to go beyond a certain boundary to stop some of the uh, the fighting going on between the two parties because the English were not, you know, the British Empire was not interested in spending more resource, you know, funneling more resources into the American colonies to wage war against natives for no real right. gain. Yeah, I can see the point of that law is to stop walking over to them and risking getting attacked or held hostage. Right, right. Stop being a potential liability by wandering off like that. I think that could be an interpretation. Let's hear about this this anti-native propaganda. In the form of books, captivity narratives in which Europeans recounted their desire to return to Christian society after living with the Indians were quite popular, even though some, like the famous Sovereignty and Goodness of God by Mary Rowlandson, did admit that the Indians often treated their European captives quite well. New well, I, I mean, the thing is, though, like, yeah, it's a natural thing for all humans to be want to like to want to be with their own groups. It's like, 
I don't think he, I mean, he show, says showing that's... remorse for for going native isn't isn't like uh isn't just like a propagandistic thing. It's it's you know something that actually happens because people realize you know the grass ain't that the grass ain't that greener on the other side. Actually, you know I want to be with English people with English society and stuff that I'm used to instead of this. I think the main point he's trying to say is that there again there, I mean just tabulate all the all the deep throating he's doing of these Amerindians. Like, apparently, they don't start any of the conflicts. They're very, 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 very nice to the English, and they fed them, and the only reason that these Amerindians fought with each other is because they were given guns or they were forced into some kind of resource scarcity or competition with the other Amerindians. They treated their cap, the people they held captive super-duper well. And, and apparently, also, they even when they massacre hundreds of men, women, and children, it's just an uprising. They did, this dude is an unpaid propagandist fuckwagon, just unambiguously. Oh, he's probably paid. He's probably paid pretty well <laughs> uh, to get these production values. Well, I know he's paid, but I'm saying, like, I don't know if there's, like, the American Indian movement is, is funding Crash Course history. Like, I don't know about that. Oh, I mean, good point from, from uh, Finn Wraith in the chat. I see no reason to believe, without evidence, that natives would have been any less interested in wanting to live with the Europeans than the other way, and the Europeans were more advanced. Yeah, that's a good, that's a very good point. You know, this this phenomenon was likely two sided. Um, the ratio of which we should assume at first was probably equal. Um, but I mean, there's no like it takes evidence to show it, it's one way or the one way or the other. Well, like, and in the context of a war, too, what would appease these shit libs like John Green? Like, should the yeah. Europeans have just rolled over and taken it, allowed themselves to be, you know, kidnapped, raped, and murdered? Well, see, it wouldn't have happened if the white man didn't start it, though. The white man always starts everything. Which I have a hard time believing, because th there's just... And to use the some academic language, it's not a very nuanced look at it. There's just there's just no way that one people could be always so consistently the source of all the problems. That's how you know you have a blood libel narrative being foisted upon you. Like that's just materialistically not possible. And that's the thing too is like if I were to craft a sort of oppression narrative, I would at least throw in from time to time like some just because we know that. People are not all good. You know, no subset of the population is all good. There are some bad eggs. So from time to time, I'd throw in, yeah, they did do this, but like he, he won't even admit that. He won't even admit that the Indians did anything wrong at any point in time ever. Right. Again, you try to think of the worst thing they did where they massacred a bunch of people, and it, it's just an uprising. It's just an uprising. It's a rebellion. The rebellion at uh, My Lay in Vietnam in March 1968, just a rebellion. <laughs> All right. Let's continue. Oh, okay. Yeah, Jim. Okay. Yeah, Jim's saying he's got some problems. A weird lag with the click, I think, because I'm not hosting it. Yeah. Okay. Well, you can just, you just tell us to pause and we'll pause it. It's no big deal. All right. Oh, but uh, a comment from Damian Wilson. Uh, oh man, growing up in Canada, we got it worse here because of the residential Oh, school. fuck. That uh, does yeah. I love that meme. That does sound terrible. Have you ever seen That's that meme where it's um, the Chad uh, Canadian versus the Virgin American? Where it's... Uh, hold on, let me see if I can pull it up. Just keep just keep going. Okay. After some Pequots killed an English fur trader, soldiers from Massachusetts, the newly formed colony of Connecticut, and some Narragansett Indians who saw an opportunity to gain an upper hand over the Pequots attacked a Pequot village at Mystic, burning it and massacring over 500 people. The war continued Ooh. for a few months after this. Over wow. 500 people. And we can get into this a little later just because we've already spent a considerable amount of time on this video, but the Pequots committed some heinous acts themselves that are just going to go unmentioned. Jeez, like, I wasn't realizing just how much of a liar Green is here. Holy shit. Like, wow, this video is enlightening on his character. I can see why you hate him so much. Oh, yes. He and his yeah, brother he's... are both just terrible. Hank Green. Yes, I know. I've watched those videos in my chemistry class. I'm yes, wondering what the yeah. genesis of Crash Course is. 
Oh, is, is it? Is it funded by uh, a certain Soros-related individual? I wonder. Can people hear me? It says my mic is yeah, muted. Uh, I, I can, I can oh. hear you. I can hear you. It is it doesn't say your mic is muted. Here, Jim Dewey. Can you hear combating there? Because I don't know why it's saying my voice is muted in the Discord, but obviously that can't be the case because you guys can hear me. But are you sure it says I'm you're muted? Stream, I'm looking on the Discord app because I'm trying to find that. Uh... Well, I mean, are you doing, are you doing this through your phone? No, are yeah. you doing this through your phone and your laptop? Yep. yep. Well, see, if you're doing it, if you're streaming this through your laptop, then when you go to your phone, it will have you muted yeah well that that would make sense like if i were to do this right now yeah if i were to go to the server like i'm doing this through my laptop and i'm going over to my phone and i see that yeah it has me muted okay but so everybody can actually mute. we can we can probably just continue on then yes let's go but to call it a, in a way to give it too much credit the indians were overmatched from the beginning and by the end almost all of them had been massacred or sold into slavery in the caribbean the war opened up the connecticut river Oh, 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 citations about nearly all the Indians being massacred or sold into slavery. Nearly all. I mean, yeah, I remember when I was going to get any citations. Well, don't you know that's a number? Like, I remember learning my numbers when I was younger. It went like 97, 98, nearly all, then 99, then 100. I remember learning that. <laughs> right, right. I, I the mean, number of nearly all. There's just a hole in your education. You're just uh, an irredeemable redneck cracker who just needs to do more book learning. <laughs> ...to further settlement, it also showed that Native Americans were going to have a tough time resisting because they were outnumbered and they had inferior weapons. But the brutality of the massacre in Mystic shocked even some Puritans, like William Bradford, who wrote, it was a fearful sight to see them frying in the fire. But despite the odds, New England natives continued to resist the English. In 1675, Native Americans launched their biggest attack on New England colonists in what would come to be known as King Philip's War. It was led by a Wampanoag chief named Medicom, which is why it is also sometimes called Medicom's War. The English called Medicom King Philip due to their fantastic cultural sensitivity. The conflict was marked by brutality on both sides, and it nearly ended English settlements in the Northeast. The fighting itself lasted two years. Indians attacked half of the it's 90 not, towns uh, the English you go ahead and pause and 12 of them. Yeah. Yeah. It's not the highest resolution, but this is what I'm talking about here. I can post it in the Discord, too. But <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, hold on. So you guys can react to it as well. Oh, is, is that the uh, Canadian versus American? Yeah, yep. Yeah, I need it. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and post it. I think he's trying to. Yeah. No, he won't be able to post it. Well, we won't be able to see it. <laughs> Jim is just holding up the stream for no reason. It's self sabotage. You're turning away all our viewers. Oh right, my gosh, that on. meme is so great. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <a> cool retard. <laughs> what the? <laughs> 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 Truly a Giga Chad moment. <laughs> <laughs> the one base thing Canadians have ever done. Yes, and they have absolutely flagellated themselves to no end ever since. You should, you remember that um that one uh woman who fucked up her her uh, like seismology uh gear when she was scanning the uh ground around one of the uh, residential schools? And said that there were like over fifteen hundred corpses of uh, of Native American children there, and oh. it became like a massive news story. Well, yeah, that was yeah. I remember Canada. that a year ago. Yeah, a year and a half ago. Yeah, and and Jared, Jared Taylor covered it. Obviously, yes, she was fucking wrong. And right, yes. Well, I mean, is this that people get away with this? I mean, was it weren't there? There were no actual skeletons or corpses. There found. were none. Yeah, yeah. There were uh, there were none. She just fucking well, we, her seismology gear. I mean, we should all know that the best evidence for accusing people of killing 1,500 innocents back in the day is finding no corpses or bodies. Like, I think that's usually the best piece of evidence, right? I mean, Jim, you gotta agree with me on this, right? It would seem that way. I remember you were talking to me yesterday saying you were so mad at me for the 2,000 children I killed last year, and then you sent me that picture of, like, an empty grave in my backyard, and we're like, <laughs> I got you dead to rights, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, I don't recall hearing anything about that with the seismology gear, but I absolutely believe it. I absolutely believe it. 
Yeah, um, she, the way she had fucked it up is that it made it look as if there were a bunch of corpses or whatever, or things that could be construed as corpses, but when, <clears throat> when actually calibrated properly, uh, the psychology gear showed nothing of significance. I see. Well, that, that makes sense to me. Good thing that a bunch of Canadian shit libs lost their mind over it, though. I think a church got burned down, too. Well, and that's the thing, yeah, too, is like most people are never going to see like they'll hear about the first thing that that makes headlines yep. oh mass grave found but they'll never ever see that it was recanted and so it just oh, becomes can... it becomes real in their minds yeah well you can barely find any mainstream sources that are like oh by the way that was kind of bullshit or we were kind of uh way in over our whoopsie, we got it wrong oopsie whoopsie well and yeah, i'm sure I mean, whoever he's... she's associated with didn't want to eat crow on that one either by publicizing oh, yeah. You know, hey, actually, we screwed up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But continue. Hey, no. Towns were destroyed. About 1,000 of the 52,000 Europeans and 3,000 of the 20,000 Indians involved died in the war. As a oh, wow. L look at those casualty rates. So two-thirds of all the Europeans involved, and I I'm assuming he's including civilians, and 3,000... Of twenty thousand, so fifteen percent. So, so we got about sixty-five versus fifteen percent. Which, if we're going off like uh, going off like Israel versus Gaza kind of kill count logic, clearly the Amerindians were the bad guys, like without argument. I mean, oh, yeah, right? Absolutely. That's that's, that's got to be the case. I mean, and, and none of us are Zionist shills here, but like that's that's the kind of shit lib logic where basically whoever loses the war is actually the good guy in a sense. Or who gets their ass kicked the most? Well, and that that's the thing to too is like here. even if we're looking at raw casualty numbers, which I'm always skeptical of raw casualty numbers. For those of you who have seen my my recent mm -hmm. tweets regarding the casualty numbers reported, um, you know, in the Kiev newspaper, but that's a little bit of a digression. Like even if we are to accept as fact those casualty numbers, it's not a crime to win. Like, I, I don't understand what they're driving at here. Like, should they have just laid down their arms and allowed themselves to be massacred? Yeah, well, and, and those casualty numbers actually should have been 100%. I mean, I do hope we get around to uh, the Richard Hofstadter quote at some point, probably at the end of it, where he basically makes fun of the idea that somehow the natives weren't brutal as well. But I, I, hope, we, I hope we get around to that. I think it's on our Google Yeah, I've, I've got it pulled up. Okay, cool. Before, yeah, just the war where... was particularly brutal. The Battle of the Great Swamp was really just a massacre of Indians by the English. And when King Philip was finally killed... Okay, so it was brutal, but but only English were brutal. Battle okay, okay, okay. I see how it is. Swamp. Now, the, the way he makes it sound is like it was a battle, but was it a massacre because they got their ass beat so hard? <laughs> that seems to be the prevailing narrative any time... Like, imagine getting your ass kicked so hard that you have to go back and call it a genocide. Well, I mean, if there were civilians killed, then I guess at that point they could get called a massacre. But weirdly enough, like, the Indians, or the Amerindians, sorry, we're, we're using them pretty interchangeably. Like, they would show much quarter, like they did with the Jamestown people. Like, obviously, civilians were not off limits. They were not saying, oh, I mean, we'll just have to take them as a prisoner because we've got to follow the Geneva Convention. It's like, go fuck yourself. Killed, ending the decapitated head was placed on a stake in the Plymouth Town Square where it remained for decades. And on the other Based. Side Based. <laughs> Based, but also decades, really? <laughs> yeah, it's just a skull at that point. I mean, unless the flesh yeah. somehow stayed on it the whole time, which I, I doubt. Well, the flesh yeah, was probably I, I, turned I into uh, castor oil, if you are to believe um, suffrage church. Oh, really? <laughs> or, or did they probably turn it into soap or lampshades? Soap or lampshades. <laughs> Well, to quote Nathaniel Saltonstall, who lived through the war, the heathen rarely gave quarter to those that they take, but if they were women, they first forced them to satisfy their filthy lusts and then murdered them. Saltonstall went on to describe a particularly brutal way that natives would kill colonists' cows by cutting their bellies and letting them go several days, trailing their guts after them. That indigenous people would reserve such brutality for livestock says something really important about this war. The Indians correctly saw European colonization as a threat to their way of life, and that includes uh oh. Indian. Oh. Here we go. 
So you're so, saying... so, he, so he admits a little bit that that they were extremely brutal, but also that um, but but he's trying to say, oh, it's justified because the, the European, the you know, the English were were a threat to the, the, the way I life, think the way I think life is on the line. I think more saliently, he's bringing up that mass immigration is a threat to the native population. Their way of life was in in, in danger as a result of the influx of um, immigrants who did not share culture, race, or religion with them. Why would they so badly want to preserve their way of life? Why can't they stay with the? Uh, why can't they adopt to the times? And those I, I, I evil want racist to, Native Americans with their closed want, borders. I want you to. Oh, I put this in the wrong server. If you go to video ideas, Jim, on your server, I put a meme there that I want you to show if you can. Sure. Yeah, that that uh, is in tune with what we're talking. about. Because again, the, all this this emphasis on the native culture. Lamau, dude, nationalism is dumb. Borders and ethnicities are at arbitrary constructs, and it's racist and pseudo scientific to try and preserve your people or homeland. The future is a global cosmopolitan society. I I can't pronounce these words. Also. <laughs> Also, also, free Palestine, <laughs> Kurdistan independence, or Kurdistan independence for Catalonia. The Malvinas are Argentinian. Colonialism was bad because it was extinguished because it extinguished native cultures. Yeah, I mean the yes. cognitive dissonance is real. Oh yeah. No, what? What? No, you see, what seems irrational is actually perfectly rational when you realize, oh, this is just constructed to go after white folks like us. That's the logical consistency of it. You know, it's kind of like the philosophy of neoconservatism, where it's like, oh, it's not actually a very good ideology because, you know, uh, this, this dude, Stephen Walt, wrote an article in Foreign Policy saying, like, it doesn't account for all these things. Neoconservatism uh, is not actually very rigorous. It's like, well, not when you apply that standard to it, but when the intention behind neoconservatism is to hijack the U.S. government for the benefit of the Likud party in Israel then it's a very functional ideology that's worked really, really well. So, of course, the, whatever this dude in this meme is saying might seem inconsistent, but its function is designed to make people like us seem bad and feel like shit. Like, that's the intention behind it, and it's actually working very well. Well, we can touch on that after the video, but that's that's why this stuff is so important. That's why I feel impelled to talk about it, because it's not just you know, petty squabbling over, you know, some insignificant and meaningless event 400, 500 years ago. It's used in the modern day to drive real concrete political action that is harmful to white people. Yes, it's the oppression narrative, as Ryan Falk calls it. It is the cudgel in the club used to justify every act of bigotry against us. Why can't we form a white student union, right? How come affirmative action explicitly doesn't work in our favor. Why is that tolerated? Why is that allowed? Well, because we were supposedly did bad thing back then. We did this bad thing. And so well, and you have to attack that or you're screwed. You know, and, and white people have to bear the sins of their fathers or even the supposed sins of their fathers, but that same standard is never applied. Like, would, <laughs> would the left, um, you know, hold Japanese children responsible for Pearl Harbor or the rape of Nanking? No. No, they would not. And they'll just cry about internment camps. <laughs> what about you know? the fucking Mongols? What about the Mongols? I, this is what, a point that Douglas Murray makes in The Strange Death of Europe. He devotes a, a few pages to that. It's like, how come we don't flagellate the uh, the Turkish Ottomans so much for their colonialism? Remember, they, they occupied Greece, and the Greeks had to fight a revolutionary war to get them out in the 1820s. And, you know, what about the Mongols? What the Mongols with all the destruction, the havoc, and all the, the texts that they've destroyed all well, these years. Aren't they liable for that as well? All those poor Mongolians in there? That's the currently? same thing, too. Like, the hypocrisy of John and Hank Green in particular just blows my mind. Because if you watch their um, world history series, they are constantly just sucking the dick of the, Mong the Mongol Empire. Like, oh, over yes. and over yeah. and over again. Oh, yeah. But they, no you know, they would never, ever talk about the brutality of the mongols in a negative light not in the same way that white people should you know feel terrible about any bad thing ever done by a white man ever and that's a good point now that you bring it up i mean 
maybe it's because it's older history. We have more of a an unsentimental distance from it. We're not as like emotionally attached when we talk about big wars or big brutality or body counts. I think that's part of it. But it is strange that you kind of reduce the the rank brutality of the Mongols into something that's kind of a meme when in actuality if any of what was what the mongols did was done by the americans you can bet your ass that the green brothers would be hounding us for it till the day well we and die. anything the mongols in particular did was an order of magnitude worse than anything yes. done by you know european colonial empires like the mongols raped the population of the world so hard that there's a significant <laughs> probability that you know, if you if you select at random people from the regions controlled by the Mongolian Empire, it's it's altogether likely that you've got like DNA of Genghis Khan himself. In yes, you. You correct. Know, yeah, that may be slight right. hyperbole, but something to that effect. Mm -hmm. Land and whose grazing patterns required the English to take more and more territory. Some of the stories told about Native American brutality also suggest the symbolic nature of this war, like one English colonist was disemboweled and had a Bible stuck in his body cavity. Supposedly that's true. The that's what I was talking about explained. yesterday. You English. Oh, that actually happened. Yeah, that actually happened where um, a pure that was during the Pequot War, where a Puritan um, was disemboweled and had a Bible stuffed in the empty cavity and they sewed it up. They sewed him back up and left him where, you know, the other Puritans were going to find him. Right. Very classy. Now, the weird part is, the angle he's approaching from is he's... It's he's symbolic. Kind of right, it's, it's symbolic, but I think he's he's trying to... What he's getting at is he's mocking the evil white people for, like, uh, propagandistically putting themselves in a victimized light, which is hilarious because as if they're the only ones that ever do that. But of course, he only makes fun of it when supposedly white people do. It's well, and big, big shocker, there's another double standard. You can bet your ass, too, that if it had been the other way around, if at any point in time white people had disemboweled a Native American or an Amerindian and stuffed some symbol of their religion inside the empty cavity and, like, left it in the middle of an Indian, like, left it next to yes. a wigwam for them to find, you can bet that... That would be like the number one thing any kid knows about, you know, Native American, oh, yeah, he would, white people he would, relations. Oh, yeah. He would believe the account without a shred of incredulity. Yeah, like the, the fact that he, like, tries to make it out that the English were the only aggressors and that the Native Americans, like, all they did was just in response to an existential threat or whatever. They tried to, the, the fact that he tries to, like, make it out like that and tries to justify their brutality uh it is it's so fucking disgusting this like i remember ryan once said that um and i really understand it he, he had once said that if he could delete if he could delete yes, any yes, channel yes. from youtube it would be crash course <laughs> yeah if you, if you could <laughs> I, nuke, I agree 100 i think he said if you could nuke it from orbit or something he would, yeah. he would do that and that's totally apt he is spot on no and and that's oh, oh, yeah. oh but in in the chat with um then race. They now have these anti-racist movements in European countries that have no history of oppressing non-whites. And then a comment from Victor. Yeah, even Finland. Well, th don't you know that Finland produced some rubber that was used in, s in slave ships? And oh, so now shit. they're completely 100% at fault for slavery? It's all like, over. It was actually like, yeah, the, the shitlibs were basically celebrating when they, when they found out that Ugh. um that had happened because, like, because um the shitlibs in Finland for the longest time, didn't have like actually anything to uh, kvetch about, and uh, yeah. And, but now that apparently one factory made some rubber for slave ships, um, you know, apparently that makes Finns like super, super guilty of slavery and all that. It's it's fucking disgusting. Well, I mean, there, there's a very, very, very perverse pathology within white people is to find things wrong with them. Like I've heard a quote from someone saying that. Like, the most vociferous criticism of the West comes from people in the West. Like, th there is a very strong masochistic pathology within our people that is kind of a problem. Well, and it's novel, oh, yeah. certainly within the last century. Like, if you were to oh, go back into, 19, sure. you know, 1920, you would not find anybody apologetic for the things, that, unless they were a literal Marxist, which is another thing entirely, but on the whole... And also, Certainly you have to remember, 
most of these white people are not our people. Ah, well, that might matter. Yes, indeed. They did a bit of shit stirring in that department. But, um, yeah, uh, I think I saw a meme. I, I sent in this chat a Finland um, ball meme that I want Jim to put on the screen, too. Yeah, sure, just let me pull it up here. Yeah. Okay, these are great. I am saving those to my phone. See, this is what happens when uh, we all collaborate, is we get some really, really dank memes. <laughs> When you get colonized by two different countries, your people are starved and used as cannon fodder to fight their wars. You are treated as literal subhumans based on racist pseudoscience. Your children are taken as slaves by the Turks. And there's a systemat systematic effort to wipe out your culture, heritage, and language. And you get told you benefit from white privilege. <laughs> Yeah, and, and that could just be, I mean, you could, you could just have the white ball there. I mean, that's not, that's something that is unique to white empires and white nations. That's not, the mm -hmm. Chinese are never told to apologize for anything they've done. The Japanese are never told to apologize for anything they've done. Not serious. Yeah, oh, they're never told to apologize for anything they've done. The Arabs, the, the Muslims. The oh, Hindus. I mean, uh, I mean, th this is something, white. this is something I forgot about. The, the, the Chinese or the Chinese Empire in the 1750s literally perpetrated a genocide. I'm going to put the Wikipedia link in the chat and then in general. The, uh, the Dzungar genocide, a mass extermination of the Mongol Dzungar people by the Qing dynasty. Like 420 to 480,000 people killed. 70 to 80 percent of the population, that's significant like i want people to try and imagine for a moment what four hundred and twenty thousand at a minimum bodies looks like back in the 1750s too, there right weren't now. as there weren't as many people on the globe back then no like just straight and, up uh, <laughs> yeah i like that. and so this this highlights another stark difference between uh whites and other races is that when other races rule another population that population declines when whites rule another population that population drastically increases well now you know like india was the worst genocide ever because like their population over doubled under rule uh wait, wait the, the the amerindians did well india Oh, India. Oh, right. When the when the British were in there, yes. Also, the Amerindian decline itself um, was. Uh, let me look here. Well, I mean, there's like three main reasons. I believe I it was one. Well, while you're looking at that too, there's a point I want to bring up. It's like, yeah, you will never. I want to read this quote by the Xianlong Emperor. Um, you know, as oh, translated go. by this du dude who said, "Show no mercy at all to these rebels. Only the old and weak should be saved." Our previous say military the campaigns were too lenient. If we act as before, our troops will withdraw and further trouble will occur. If a rebel is captured and his followers wish to surrender, he must personally come to the garrison, prostrate himself before the commander, and request surrender. If he only sends someone to request submission, it is undoubtedly a trick. That is something <laughs> that you will never... This is this is the leader. This is, this is an emperor. This is an emperor. From time to yeah. time, you can find, you know quotes from white people to that effect you know i think the famous one being kill them all or old and young nits make lice with with regard to one of the uh, native american massacres but that man was he was brought before Cong congress and called the answer for what he had done like this is something that other races other empires like from the top down was the directive given you know this is what they did right We'll continue. Well, anyhow, on. yes, let's uh, get going. So uh, let's go back ten seconds. Brutality also suggests the symbolic nature of this war. Like one English colonist was disemboweled and had a Bible. Yeah, uh, the fact in that he says this with almost a smile on his face. Explained, you English, since you came into this country, have grown exceedingly above the ground. Let us see how well you grow when planted into the ground. But it wasn't Ooh. just the Indians who felt their Jesus way of life being Christ. threatened. It's time for this week's mystery document. 
rules here are simple. I read the mystery document, I try to guess its author. If I'm right, I don't get shocked with the shock pen. If I'm wrong, I do. The righteous God hath heightened our calamity and given commission to the barbarous heathen to rise up against us and to become a smart rod and a severe scourge to us in burning and depopulating several hopeful plantations, murdering many of our people of all sorts and seeming as it were to cast us off. Hereby speaking aloud to us to search and try out our ways and turn again unto the Lord our God from whom we have departed with a great backsliding. Okay, I don't know this one, so I'm gonna have to piece it together. Uh, we have a plural narrator, that's important. Seemingly monotheistic, feels like the heathens in this context, likely the Native Americans have been sent as a scourge or scourge as it is apparently properly pronounced. What, I'm from Alabama. I don't know how to say a ton of words. I mean, I just recently learned that you don't check your Yahoo mail, you check your Yahoo mail, and Yahoo's over already. Right, so plural narrator, scourge, great backsliding. Oh, uh, Stan, you're gonna get the shock here this time. Who is it? The laws of war passed by the General Court of Massachusetts in 1675? Are you kidding? From now on, the mystery document must always be written by a single human person. I hate this. I hate this so much. It's worse now, because I've had it before. Okay, this is weird. Does this thumb look like it's raisiny? Yeah, it looks pruny. It does. Uh -huh. it, it does. Like he's been in the shower for twenty-five minutes or something. Also, I've seen shock pens before, and usually the metal clicker or the clicker on the pen itself is is metal, and that one is very obviously plastic. I'm not mm. directly calling bullshit, but uh, I'm color me skeptical. And You're skeptical, rate, like, Sam. I mean, just. Out of, out of all the mystery documents he could have pulled, it's probably like the one document where Europeans have you know are saying, "Yeah, we we did bad, guys." Yeah, oh yeah, of all the no, I, true of literally all the documents, I'm sure. No, no, he picked uh, the most moderate one or the most mild one. He he would have reserved the worst one for nothing, right? He he would have totally done that. So now it's gonna. F ah! This shows us the way the Puritans understand the world, but it also shows us that within 50 years of its founding, Puritans already felt that the mission of their colony to be a great Christian community was already kind of a failure. If they'd been as righteous as they were supposed to be, God wouldn't have sent the Indians to burn their homes and kill them. So it's important to understand that this was a war to preserve a way of life for both the Indians and the English. And that brings us to another question. What's the point of hey, even I'm telling these that. bloody stories about massacres and point is to remind ourselves that much of what we learn about American history, like all history, has been cleaned up to conform to our mythological... No, it fucking hasn't anymore. It absolutely uh, hasn't. I don't know that it ever thanks, has been to thanks, begin with. Thanks to shit I don't think it ever was. was. Well, and right, yeah. it's important to note that there's not a ton of context in that document, too. What that strikes me as is not, hey, us Europeans were super, super terrible to the Indians, therefore we're getting punished by God. It strikes me as more of a sinners in the hands of an angry God type document, generally speaking, where because you are wicked in your day-to-day -day lives, that's why the Indians are here. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, but continuing, let's see if we can finish this video. View of ourselves. Native Americans have been so successfully marginalized, both geographically no, they and haven't. metaphorically, no, they that haven't. it's easy to either forget about them Go ahead or and else pause to it. view them merely as people to be. Pause it. What do you okay. mean they've been marginalized? They're the, they literally have a casino monopoly. They're the only ones who are allowed to have casinos in the United States, and they make a killing off of it. There are certain tribes where so long as you're a member of that tribe, you get a six-figure income like every year just for free for doing nothing. So don't tell me that they're marginalized or they're so put upon. Yeah, when, when all the schools, when all the inst institutions are saying that they are marginalized and that they are oppressed and then any more Gibbs from Whitey who did them wrong, I don't think they're marginalized actually. And I remember from somewhere, the in terms of education costs per student, I believe Amerindian children get, or at least are in some way on the average, are funded like twice as much as your normal American kid. Oh, like they, yeah. They, I, if you could, um, if you can prove that you are a certain percentage uh, Native American admixture, you get free education. Just ah, I see. Up. That's right. Uh, it, it, right, it, and that's it, to say nothing of the you know affirmative action aspect of it, like. You get prefer preferential treatment in anything you have to apply for, more or less. Oh, exactly. 
I mean, just just by being who you are and having a pulse, you have a pretty solid crack at whatever college you want. Or jobs in general, too, because they got to fill their quotas. All right, moving on. Or reviled. But it's important to know the ways that they resisted colonization because it reminds us that Native Americans were people who acted in history, not just people who were acted upon by it. And it also reminds us that the history of indigenous people on this landmass isn't separate from American history, it's an essential part of it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. Crash Course is producing.